So first of all, I want to make sure that uh, that we're all on the same page. Let me just step step back for a minute. This is sort of how I envision what happens when I'm seeing patients in my clinic, and I tell them different things. So if I tell somebody that you have MCI or mild cognitive impairment, um, they, they're like, "Yeah, that doesn't sound so good." And then if we talk about somebody having dementia. Uh, that sounds really not so good. But then if I say the word Alzheimer's, uh, all of a sudden um, the, uh, the, the, the scare factor goes up astronomically. So I wanna make sure we understand what we're talking about when we talk about these terms. So first of all, um, what is the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? That's probably the single most common question we get. And, uh, and so one of the analogies that I use is to tell people, well, you know, if you say you have dementia, it's kind of like saying, I have a headache. And then whether it's mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia or severe dementia, maybe just a consequence of how bad that headache is. So I just got a little tiny headache and now I've got a terrible migraine headache. Um, so that's a milder or more severe. Um, but just saying that I have a headache doesn't tell you why you're having the headache. So it may be that you've got an aneurysm that's about to rupture, and that's a, that's a very specific cause for a headache, and that could be a problem. Or you could be Tiger Woods, and you were a bonehead, and your wife took a seven iron upside your head. That's a whole other reason for a headache. Uh, but either of those things can be the cause of a headache. So when we say somebody has dementia or memory loss, that's just a symptom, like having your head hurt. But it's not saying what's causing uh, that problem to occur, the memory loss or the dementia symptoms. And regardless, and there are lots of different things we'll talk about what can cause um, cognitive problems, memory loss and dementia, but if it's due to a degenerative process, something that's gonna get worse over time, uh, they all follow a similar course. It's so early on in the course of the, uh, the disease, um, the, the symptoms may be very mild. That's where this mild cognitive impairment comes in. And during that phase of any illness, um, while there may be a clear decline from your normal baseline, uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the impairments or the difficulties that you're having are typically mild. And many of these patients who even though they had some decline, they're still functioning normally. I've had patients who have um, symptoms of mild cognitive impairment that are pr still practicing law uh, medicine even, um, and uh, managing companies, um, despite these difficulties, because the symptoms are so mild. The problem is when we're talking about diseases, it gets worse over time. Over the course of time in early stages, when things have gotten worse and there's some worsening of, uh, of memory and other thinking problems, and you need a little bit more support with things, that's a little bit more problematic, but quality of life at these milder stages can still be excellent. But unfortunately, for those of us who um, know and, uh, and either care for or have uh, experience with friends and family and other loved ones who have more severe dementia, uh, there's a much more profound loss of abilities, sometimes behavioral problems, increasing burden on those around the ind affected individual. And then in late stages, it's really a devastating loss of quality of life. So no matter what the cause is that we're talking about, when things are progressive, when there's a disease that gets over time, uh, worse over time, the, uh, the decline in functional ability and the worsening of quality of life is what the big problem is. So I want you to remember this. I'm going to come back to this. And the diseases, when we talk about Alzheimer's disease, um, Alzheimer's disease just happens to be the most common disease that causes progressive memory loss and progressive dementia uh, symptoms, especially in older adults. But it's certainly not the only one. There are many other diseases. This isn't meant to be com uh, comprehensive, but there are many other diseases that can cause similar deterioration, but it's caused by a different underlying process, different changes in the brain in each of these conditions. And Alzheimer's disease is the one that we've really chosen to focus on because this is far and away the biggest problem uh, and the most common reason why um, older individuals suffer from memory loss and progressive deterioration. And so um, what do I mean when I say somebody has Alzheimer's disease? So this is a famous picture of a lady named uh, Auguste Dieter, who was the first patient uh, who was studied um, by um, Dr. Alzheimer. 
uh, back in the early 1900s. And you see, she developed symptoms at a very early age, in her early 50s. But she had those symptoms that we currently recognize um, occurring in people who have Alzheimer's disease. So she had progressive memory loss. She started to become suspicious that her husband was uh, being unfaithful to her. Um, she had worsening um, language abilities and, and progressive functional decline. And she died at the ripe old age of 55, which is obviously very, very young. And this fellow, um, Alzheimer, studied her during her life and examined her brain after her death. And, uh, and he described, these are not pictures from his drawings, he actually drew uh, line drawings of what he saw. But these are the features that he recognized that we still recognize today as the key changes that occur inside the brains of individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And so this center blob here is something called an amyloid plaque or a senile plaque made up of a protein called amyloid beta or a beta. And these dark triangular looking things are abnormal uh, proteins that are accumulated inside a brain cell. So this triangular cell is actually a brain cell inside a person's brain. And this abnormal protein called tau has accumulated. So these plaques and tangles are found 100% of the time. And anybody who has suffered decline and died because of Alzheimer's disease, if you look at their brain under a microscope, you will see these two changes in 100% of cases. And one of the important advances, so at the time that Alzheimer was um, meeting and studying um, Frau Dieter, uh, Ms. Dieter, um, Alzheimer's disease was not very well understood. However, the, uh, the process of age-related uh, memory changes, you know, what people used to call senility or hardening of the arteries, these things were known since antiquity. But what has changed in recent decades is we've really learned to, uh, to approach Alzheimer's disease as a chronic condition. And so when I say a chronic condition, I mean like a chronic medical condition like heart disease or cancer. Um, and, uh, and so if we think about this in terms of heart disease, um, you don't all of a sudden wake up one day and have a heart attack. That process was evolving for many years as the, the blood vessels that supply your heart gradually became more and more blocked by these, um, these abnormal things that occur in the, uh, the coronary arteries. And eventually when the blockages of those arteries become critical, there's not enough blood flow to supply the heart's needs. And that's when uh, chest pain or angina or heart attack occur. And so this is a chronic process that occurs over many years. And what we've come to understand about Alzheimer's disease is it's exactly the same thing. So out here on this graph, you know, out in this right end side of this is where people are having symptoms of memory loss and progressive dementia. So this curve is now flipped compared to what I showed you with the line going up indicating increased uh, symptoms, clinical symptoms. And, um, and what we've come to realize is that the changes, the plaques and tangles that I just described in the, uh, the Alzheimer's disease brain, those changes are accumulating for up to 20 years before somebody actually experiences symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. So just like in heart disease, um, the, uh, the blockages of the coronary arteries may be evolving for 10, 20 years before somebody has a heart attack. And the same thing applies for Alzheimer's disease. We know that these changes occur inside our brains um, completely silently. Uh, without causing any symptoms. And that may happen up to starting up to 20 years before somebody actually shows symptoms and may be clinically diagnosed with uh, mild cognitive impairment or dementia because of underlying Alzheimer's disease. So this is a real challenge, but it's also a real opportunity. Because um, over the last um, couple of decades, we've also developed tools that allow us to detect the presence of those plaques and tangles inside the human brain um, without having to wait until somebody has died. So many years ago, people used to say, well, you, you can't really be sure it's Alzheimer's disease until you're dead and you look at your brain under a microscope. That used to be true, but that is no longer true because we have these tools. And, and these are pictures from um, a special scan. So these are pictures of a, of a brain. And on the left here is an individual who has Alzheimer's disease, has symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. 
And what we're looking at is um, injection of something into the bloodstream that gets up into the brain. And if there are amyloid plaques inside the brain, this dye sticks to those areas and gives off a signal that we can detect. As opposed to a healthy person with no amyloid plaques, and, uh, and you don't see any of this staining or this uh, binding of this dye. And so we can clearly discriminate that. And then also those tangles, this is a front view. So these are side views of the brain, and this is a front view of the brain with the brain cut sort of vertically. And you can actually detect the presence of that tangle pathology using a different dye. And so these are tools that we have currently that we can use to visualize these pathologies inside the human brain. But what I'm showing you here now is another scan from a healthy person, a normal person without any memory problems, without any functional limitations. And you see that this person also has a substantial amount of the plaque or amyloid pathology. And this is what I'm, when I say that we can detect the presence of this pathology many years before somebody develops symptoms, we might see a scan like this in somebody who already has significant memory problems and symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, uh, or we may see this in somebody who doesn't have any uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And so this is sort of the, uh, the inflection point where we, we're working right now. And so the Emory Healthy Brain Study has only one goal, um, and that is um, to, uh, to be able to make a prediction. So if I can detect the presence of these pathologies inside the brain of a healthy person, um, I need to be able to answer two really important questions. One is, am I ever going to get Alzheimer's disease? I, we, when we look at the brains of older, healthy individuals who died without any memory problems or symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, and a large proportion of those individuals, if you manage to live into your 80s or 90s, in a large proportion of healthy individuals, we will see Alzheimer's pathology, but they never develop symptoms during life. And so it's really important to be able to answer this question. Am I ever going to develop symptoms of Alzheimer's disease? I don't really care if I have a brain full of plaques and tangles if I don't have any symptoms being caused by those. And then, um, and then secondly, if I'm going to develop symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, when is that gonna happen? Because if I detect the presence of these changes in the brain of a 75 year old, but I know that they're not gonna develop any symptoms for 20 years, then what should I do to that person? I should leave them alone. Um, I shouldn't go and do crazy stuff that might potentially cause harm if they're very unlikely to develop symptoms during their um, lifetime. So this is the sole purpose, the only reason why we're doing the Emory Healthy Brain Study.